Chapter 30, Part 1 of Social Statics by Herbert Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Social Statics, or the Conditions Essential to Human Happiness Specified, and the First of Them Developed, by Herbert Spencer. General Considerations, Part 1, Sections 1 through 7. 1. Social philosophy may be aptly divided, as political economy has been, into statics and dynamics. The first treating of the equilibrium of a perfect society, the second of the forces by which society is advanced towards perfection. To determine what laws we must obey for the obtainment of complete happiness is the object of the one, whilst that of the other is to analyze the influences which are making us competent to obey these laws. Hitherto we have concerned ourselves chiefly with the statics, touching upon the dynamics only occasionally for purposes of elucidation. Now, however, the dynamics claim special attention. Some of the phenomena of progress already referred to need further explanation, and many others associated with them remain to be noticed. There are also sundry general considerations not admissible into foregoing chapters, which may here be fitly included. 2. And first, let us mark that the course of civilization could not possibly have been other than it has been. Whether a perfect social state might have been at once established, and why, if it might have been, it was not, why for unnumbered ages the world was filled with inferior creatures only, and why mankind were left to make it fit for human life by clearing it of these, are questions that need not be discussed here. But given an unsubdued earth, giving the being, man, appointed to overspread and occupy it, given the laws of life what they are, and no other series of changes than that which has taken place, could have taken place. For be it remembered that the ultimate purpose of creation, the production of the greatest amount of happiness, can be fulfilled only under certain fixed conditions. Each member of the race fulfilling it must not only be endowed with faculties enabling him to receive the highest enjoyment in the act of living, but must be so constituted that he may obtain full satisfaction for every desire, without diminishing the power of others to obtain like satisfaction. Nay, to fulfill the purpose perfectly must derive pleasure from seeing pleasure in others. Now, for beings thus constituted to multiply in a world already tenanted by inferior creatures, creatures that must be dispossessed to make room, is a manifest impossibility. By the definition, such beings must lack all desire to exterminate the races they are to supplant. They must indeed have a repugnance to exterminating them, for the ability to derive pleasure from seeing pleasure involves the liability to pain from seeing pain. The sympathy by which either of these results is effected, simply having for its function to reproduce observed emotions, irrespective of their kind. Evidently, therefore, having no wish to destroy, to destroy giving them, on the contrary, disagreeable sensations, these hypothetical beings, instead of subjugating and overspreading the earth, must themselves become the prey of pre-existing creatures in whom destructive desires predominate. How, then, are the circumstances of the case to be met? Evidently, the aboriginal man must have a constitution adapted to the work he has to perform, joined with a dormant capability of developing into the ultimate man when the conditions of existence permit. To the end that he may prepare the earth for its future inhabitants, his descendants, he must possess a character fitting him to clear it of races endangering his life, and races occupying the space required by mankind. 
Hence he must have a desire to kill, for it is the universal law of life that to every needful act must attach a gratification, the desire for which may serve as a stimulus. He must further be devoid of sympathy, or must have but the germ of it, for he would otherwise be incapacitated for his destructive office. In other words, he must be what we call a savage, and must be left to acquire fitness for social life as fast as the conquest of the earth renders social life possible. Whoever thinks that a thoroughly civilized community could be formed out of men qualified to wage war with the pre-existing occupants of the earth, that is, whoever thinks that men might behave sympathetically to their fellows whilst behaving unsympathetically to inferior creatures will discover his error on looking at the facts. He will find that human beings are cruel to one another in proportion as their habits are predatory. The Indian, whose life is spent in the chase, delights in torturing his brother man as much as in killing game. His sons are schooled into fortitude by long days of torment, and his squaw made prematurely old by hard treatment. The treachery and vindictiveness which Bushmen or Australians show to one another and to Europeans are accompaniments of that never-ceasing enmity existing between them and the denizens of the wilderness. Amongst partially civilized nations, the two characteristics have ever borne the same relationship. Thus the spectators in the Roman amphitheaters were as much delighted by the slaying of gladiators as by the death struggles of wild beasts. The ages during which Europe was thinly peopled and hunting a chief occupation were also the ages of feudal violence, universal brigandage, dungeons, tortures. Here in England, a whole province depopulated to make game preserves, and a law sentencing to death the serf who killed a stag, show how great activity of the predatory instinct and utter indifference to human happiness coexisted. In later days, when bull-baiting and cock-fighting were common pastimes, the penal code was far more severe than now. Prisons were full of horrors, men put in the pillory were maltreated by the populace, and the inmates of lunatic asylums, chained naked to the wall, were exhibited for money and tormented for the amusement of visitors. Conversely, amongst ourselves, a desire to diminish human misery is accompanied by a desire to ameliorate the condition of inferior creatures. Whilst the kindlier feeling of men is seen in all varieties of philanthropic effort, in charitable societies, in associations for improving the dwellings of the laboring classes, in anxiety for popular education, in attempts to abolish capital punishment, in zeal for temperance reformation, in ragged schools, in endeavors to protect climbing boys, in inquiries concerning labor and the poor, in emigration funds, in the milder treatment of children, and so on. It also shows itself in societies for the prevention of cruelty to animals, in acts of parliament to put down the use of dogs for purpose of draft, in the condemnation of steeplechases and battues, in the late inquiry why the pursuers of a stag should not be punished as much as the carter who maltreats his horse, and lastly in vegetarianism. Moreover, to make the evidence complete, we have the fact that men, partially adapted to the social state, retrograde on being placed in circumstances which call forth the old propensities. The barbarizing of colonists who live under aboriginal conditions is universally remarked. The back settlers of America, amongst whom unavenged murders, rifle duels, and lynch law prevail, or better still, the trappers who, leading a savage life, have descended to savage habits, to scalping, and occasionally even to cannibalism, sufficiently exemplify it. But indeed, without collecting from so wide a field illustrations of the truth that the behavior of men to the lower animals and their behavior to each other bear a constant relationship, it becomes clear 
but such is the fact on observing that the same impulses govern in either case. The blind desire to inflict suffering distinguishes not between the creatures who exhibit that suffering, but obtains gratification indifferently from the agonies of beast and human being, delights equally in worrying a brute and in putting a prisoner to the rack. Conversely, the sympathy which prevents its possessor from inflicting pain that he may avoid pain himself, and which tempts him to give happiness that he may have happiness reflected back upon him, is similarly undistinguishing. As already said, its function is simply to reproduce in one being the emotions exhibited by other beings, and every one must have noticed that it extracts pleasure from the friskiness of a newly unchained dog or excites pity for an ill-used beast of burden as readily as it generates fellow feeling with the joys and sorrows of men so that only by giving us some utterly different mental constitution could the process of civilization have been altered Assume that the creative scheme is to be wrought out by natural means, and it is necessary that the primitive man should be one whose happiness is obtained at the expense of the happiness of other beings. It is necessary that the ultimate man should be one who can obtain perfect happiness without deducting from the happiness of others. After accomplishing its appointed purpose, the first of these constitutions has to be molded into the last, and the manifold evils which have filled the world for these thousands of years, the murders, enslavings, and robberies, the tyrannies of rulers, the oppressions of class, the persecutions of sect and party, the multiform embodiments of selfishness in unjust laws, barbarous customs, dishonest dealings, exclusive manners, and the like, are simply instances of the disastrous working of this original and once needful constitution, now that mankind have grown into conditions for which it is not fitted, are nothing but symptoms of the suffering attendant upon the adaptation of humanity to its new circumstances. 3. But why, it may be asked, has this adaptation gone on so slowly? Judging from the rapidity with which habits are formed in the individual and seeing how those habits, or rather the latent tendencies towards them, become hereditary, it would seem that the needful modification should have been completed long ago. How then are we to understand the delay? The answer is that the new conditions to which adaptation has been taking place have themselves grown up but slowly. Only when a revolution in circumstances is at once both marked and permanent does a decisive alteration of character follow. If the demand for increase of power in some particular faculty is great and unceasing, development will go on with proportionate speed. And conversely, there will be an appreciable dwindling in a faculty altogether deprived of exercise. But the conditions of human life have undergone no changes sudden enough to produce these immediate results. Thus, note in the first place that the warfare between man and the creatures at enmity with him has continued up to the present time, and over a large portion of the globe is going on now. Note further that where the destructive propensities have almost fulfilled their purpose and are on the eve of losing their gratification, they make to themselves an artificial sphere of exercise by game-preserving and are so kept in activity after they would otherwise have become dormant. But note chiefly that the old predatory disposition is in a certain sense self-maintained, for it generates between men and men a hostile relationship similar to that which it generates between men and inferior animals, and by doing so provides itself a lasting source of excitement. This happens inevitably. The desires of the savage, acting, as we have seen indiscriminately, necessarily lead him to perpetual trespasses against his fellows, and consequently to endless antagonisms, to quarrels of individuals, to fightings of tribes, to feuds of clan with clan, to wars of nations. 
and thus being by their constitutions made mutual foes as well as foes to the lower races men keep alive in each other the old propensities after the original need for them has in great measure ceased hitherto then human character has changed but slowly because it has been subject to two conflicting sets of conditions on the one hand the discipline of the social state has been developing it into the sympathetic form whilst on the other hand the necessity for self-defense partly of man against brute partly of man against man and partly of societies against each other has been maintaining the old unsympathetic form and only where the influence of the first set of conditions has exceeded that of the last and then only in proportion to the excess has modification taken place amongst tribes who have kept each other's anti-social characteristics in full activity by constant conflict no advance has been possible but where warfare against man and beast has ceased to be continuous or where it has become the employment of but a portion of the people the effects of living in the associated state have become greater than the effects of barbarizing antagonisms and progress has resulted regarded thus civilization no longer appears to be a regular unfolding after a specific plan but seems rather a development of man's latent capabilities under the action of favorable circumstances which favorable circumstances mark were certain some time or other to occur those complex influences underlying the higher orders of natural phenomena but more especially those underlying the organic world work in subordination to the law of probabilities a plant for instance produces thousands of seeds the greater part of these are destroyed by creatures that live upon them or fall into places where they cannot germinate of the young plants produced by those which do germinate many are smothered by their neighbors others are blighted by insects or eaten up by animals and in the average of cases only one of them produces a perfect specimen of its species which escaping all dangers brings to maturity seeds enough to continue the race thus is it also with every kind of creature thus is it also as m quetelet has shown with the phenomena of human life and thus was it even with the germination and growth of society the seeds of civilization existing in the aboriginal man and distributed over the earth by his multiplication were certain in the lapse of time to fall here and there into circumstances fit for their development and in spite of all blightings and uprootings were certain by sufficient repetition of these occurrences ultimately to originate a civilization which should outlive all disasters and arrive at perfection four whilst the continuance of the old predatory instinct after the fulfillment of its original purpose has retarded civilization by giving rise to conditions at variance with those of social life it has subserved civilization by clearing the earth of inferior races of men the forces which are working out the great scheme of perfect happiness taking no account of incidental suffering exterminate such sections of mankind as stand in their way with the same sternness that they exterminate beasts of prey and herds of useless ruminants be he human being or be he brute the hindrance must be got rid of just as the savage has taken the place of lower creatures so must he if he have remained too long a savage give place to his superior and observe it is necessarily to his superior that in the great majority of cases he does give place for what are the prerequisites to a conquering race numerical strength or an improved system of warfare both of which are indications of advancement numerical strength implies certain civilizing antecedents deficiency of gain may have necessitated agricultural pursuits and so made the existence of a larger population possible or distance from other tribes may have rendered war less frequent and so have prevented its perpetual decimations 
or accidental superiority over neighboring tribes may have led to the final subjugation and enslaving of these, in any of which cases the comparatively peaceful condition resulting must have allowed progress to commence. Evidently, therefore, from the very beginning, the conquest of one people over another has been, in the main, the conquest of the social man over the anti-social man, or, strictly speaking, of the more adapted over the less adapted. In another mode, too, the continuance of the unsympathetic character has indirectly aided civilization whilst it has directly hindered it, namely by giving rise to slavery. It has been observed, and as it seems truly enough, that only by such stringent coercion as is exercised over men held in bondage could the needful power of continuous application have been developed. Devoid of this, as from his habits of life the aboriginal man necessarily was, and as indeed existing specimens show, probably the severest discipline continued for many generations was required to make him submit contentedly to the necessities of his new state. And if so, the barbarous selfishness which maintained that discipline must be considered as having worked a collateral benefit, though in itself so radically bad. Let not the reader be alarmed, let him not fear that these admissions will excuse new invasions and new oppressions, nor let any one who fancies himself called upon to take nature's part in this matter by providing discipline for idle Negroes or others suppose that these dealings of the past will serve for precedence. Rightly understood, they will do no such thing. That phase of civilization during which forcible supplantings of the weak by the strong and systems of savage coercion are on the whole advantageous is a phase which spontaneously and necessarily gives birth to these things. It is not in pursuance of any calmly reasoned conclusions respecting nature's intention that men conquer and enslave their fellows. It is not that they smother their kindly feelings to subserve civilization, but it is that as yet constituted they care little what suffering they inflict in the pursuit of gratification, and even think the achievement and exercise of mastery honorable. As soon, however, as there arises a perception that these subjugations and tyrannies are not right, as soon as the sentiment to which they are repugnant becomes sufficiently powerful to suppress them, it is time for them to cease. The question altogether hinges upon the amount of moral sense possessed by men, or in other words, upon the degree of adaptation to the social state they have undergone unconsciousness that there is anything wrong in exterminating inferior races or in reducing them to bondage presupposes an almost rudimentary state of men's sympathies and their sense of human rights. The oppressions they then inflict and submit to are not, therefore, detrimental to their characters, do not retard in them the growth of the social sentiments, for these have not yet reached a development great enough to be offended by such doings. And hence the aids given to civilization by clearing the earth of its least advanced inhabitants, and by forcibly compelling the rest to acquire industrial habits, are given without moral adaptation receiving any corresponding check. Quite otherwise is it, however, when the flagitiousness of these gross forms of injustice begins to be recognized. Then the times give proof that the old regime is no longer fit. Further progress cannot be made until the newly felt wrong has been done away or diminished. Were it possible under such circumstances to uphold past institutions and practices, which happily it is not, it would be at the expense of a continual searing of men's consciences. The feelings whose predominance gives possibility to an advanced social state would be constantly repressed, kept down on a level with the old arrangements to the stopping of all further progress, and before those who have grown beyond one of these probationary states 
could reinstitute it, they must resume that inferior character to which it was natural. Before a forced servitude could be again established for the industrial discipline of 800,000 Jamaica blacks, the 30 millions of English whites who established it would have to retrograde in all things, in truthfulness, fidelity, generosity, honesty, and even in material condition, for to diminish men's moral sense is to diminish their fitness for acting together, and therefore to render the best producing and distributing organizations impracticable. Another illustration, this of the perfect economy of nature. Whilst the injustice of conquests and enslavings is not perceived, they are on the whole beneficial. But as soon as they are felt to be at variance with the moral law, the continuance of them retards adaptation in one direction more than it advances it in another, a fact which our new preacher of the old doctrine, that might is right, may profitably consider a little. 5. Contrasted as are their units, primitive communities and advanced ones must essentially differ in the principles of their structure. Like other organisms, the social organism has to pass in the course of its development through temporary forms in which sundry of its functions are fulfilled by appliances destined to disappear as fast as the ultimate appliances become efficient. Associated humanity has larval appendages analogous to those of individual creatures, as in the common triton of our ponds, the external lungs of branchia dwindle away when the internal lungs have grown to maturity, and as during the embryo stage of the higher vertebrata, temporary organs appear, serve their purpose a while, and are subsequently reabsorbed leaving only signs of their having been, so in the earlier forms of the body politic do there exist institutions which, after answering their ends for a time, are superseded and become extinct. But deciduous institutions imply deciduous sentiments, dependent as they are upon popular character, established political systems cannot die out until the feeling which upholds them dies out. Hence, during man's apprenticeship to the social state, there must predominate in him some impulse corresponding to the arrangements requisite, which impulse diminishes as the probationary organization made possible by it merges into the ultimate organization. The nature and operation of this impulse now demand our attention. 6. I had so great a respect for the memory of Henry IV, said the celebrated French robber and assassin Cartouche, that had a victim I was pursuing taken refuge under his statue on the Pont Neuf, I would have spared his life. An apt illustration this of the coexistence of profound hero worship with the extremist savageness and of the means hero worship affords whereby the savage may be ruled. The necessity for some such sentiment to bind men together whilst they are as yet unsympathetic has been elsewhere shown. For the anti-social man to be transformed into the social man, he must live in the social state. But how can a society be maintained when by the hypothesis the aggressive desires of its members are destructive of it? Evidently, its members must possess some counterbalancing tendency which shall keep them in the social state despite the incongruity which shall make them submit to the restraint imposed and which shall diminish as adaptation to the new circumstances renders restraint less needful. Such counterbalancing tendency we have in this same sentiment of hero worship, a sentiment which leads men to prostrate themselves before any manifestation of power, be it in chief, feudal lord, king, or constitutional government, and makes them act in subordination to that power. 
facts illustrating this alleged connection between strength of hero worship and strength of the aggressive propensities together with other facts illustrating the simultaneous decline of both were given when the matter was first discussed now however we may appropriately examine the evidence in detail the proposition is that in proportion as the members of a community are barbarous that is in proportion as they show a lack of moral sense by seeking gratification at each other's expense in the same proportion will they show depth of reverence for authority what now are the several indications of deficient moral sense first on the list stands disregard of human life next habitual violation of personal liberty next to that theft and the dishonesty akin to it each of these if the foregoing theory be true we ought to find most prevalent where the awe of power is most profound well is it not a fact that groveling submission to despotic rule flourishes side by side with the practice of human sacrifices infanticide and assassination we find suttees and thuggy amongst a race who have ever been abject slaves in some of the pacific isles where the immolation of children to idols and the burying of parents alive are common so high is the reverence for hereditary chieftainship that it is often connected with the idea of divine power complete absolutism uniformly coexists with cannibalism we read of human hecatombs in connection with the extremest prostration of subjects to rulers in madagascar where men are put to death on the most trifling occasions and where the coast is decorated with skulls stuck on poles the people are governed on the severest maxims of feudal law by absolute chieftains under an absolute monarch the head hunting dyaks of borneo have petty tyrants over them there is autocratic government too for the bloodthirsty mongolian races both positive and negative proof of this association is given by mr grote where he says in no city of historical greece did there prevail either human sacrifices or deliberate mutilations such as cutting off the nose ears hands feet etc or castration or selling of children into slavery or polygamy or the feeling of unlimited obedience towards one man all of them customs which might be pointed out as existing amongst the contemporary carthaginians egyptians persians thracians etc if we consult mediaeval history there along with loyalty strongly manifested are the judicial combats right of private war constant wearing of arms religious martyrdoms and massacres etc to prove that life was held in less respect than now glancing over modern europe we find the assassinations of italy the cruelties of the croats and czechs and the austrian butcheries illustrating the relationship whilst amongst ourselves diminished reverence for authority has occurred simultaneously with diminished sanguinariness in our criminal code that infringements of personal liberty are greatest where awe of power is greatest is in some sort a truism seeing that forced servitude through which alone extensive violations of human liberty can be made is impossible unless the sentiment of power worship is strong thus the ancient persians could never have allowed themselves to be considered the private property of their monarchs had it not been for the overwhelming influence of this sentiment but that such submission is associated with a defect of moral sense is best seen in the acknowledged truth that readiness to cringe is accompanied by an equal readiness to tyrannize satraps lorded it over the people as their king over them the helots were not more coerced by their spartan masters than these in turn by their oligarchy of the servile hindus we are told that they indemnify themselves for their passiveness to their superiors by their tyranny cruelty and violence to those in their power during the feudal ages whilst the people were bondsmen to the nobles the nobles were vassals to their kings their kings to the pope in russia at the present moment the aristocracy are dictated to by their emperor much as they themselves dictate to their serfs 
and when to these facts we add the significant one elsewhere dwelt upon that the treatment of women by their husbands and children by their parents has been tyrannical in proportion as the servility of subjects to rulers has been extreme we have sufficient proof that hero worship is strongest where there is least regard for human freedom equally abundant evidence exists that the prevalence of theft is similarly associated with a predominance of the loyalty producing faculty books of travels give proof that amongst uncivilized races pilfering and the irresponsible power of chiefs coexist the same association of dishonesty and submissiveness is found amongst more advanced peoples it is so with the hindus with the Singhalese and with the inhabitants of Madagascar. The piracy of the Malays and of the Chinese and the long-continued predatory habits of the Arab races, both on land and sea, exist in conjunction with obedience to despotic rule. One quality, says Cole, which the Lets show with all enslaved tribes is a great disposition to thieving. The Russians, to whom worship of their emperor is a needful luxury, confess openly that they are cheats, and laugh over the confession. The Poles, whose servile salutation is, I throw myself under your feet, and amongst whom nobles are cringed to by the Jews and citizens, and these again by the people, are certainly not noted for probity. Turning to the superior races, we find that they too have passed through phases in which this same relationship of characteristics was strongly marked. Thus, the times when fealty of serfs to feudal barons was strongest were times of universal rapine. In Germany, a very large proportion of the rural nobility lived by robbery, their castles being built with a special view to this occupation, and that even by ecclesiastics. Burghers were fleeced, towns were now and then sacked, and Jews were tortured for their money. Kings were as much thieves as the rest. They laid violent hands upon the goods of their vassals, like John of England and Philip Augustus of France. They cheated their creditors by debasing the coinage. They impressed men's horses without paying for them, and they seized the goods of traders, sold them, and pocketed a large part of the proceeds. Meantime, whilst freebooters overran the land, pirates covered the sea, the Saint ports and St. Malo's being the headquarters of those infesting the English Channel. Between these days and ours, the gradual decline of loyalty, as shown in the extinction of feudal relationships, in the abandonment of divine right of kings, in the reduction of monarchical power, and in the comparative leniency with which treason is now punished, has accompanied an equally gradual increase of honesty and of regard for people's lives and liberties. By how much men are still deficient in respect for each other's rights, by so much are they still penetrated with respect for authority. And we may even trace in existing parties the constant ratio preserved between these characteristics. It has been shown, for instance, that the unskilled laborers of the metropolis, who instead of entertaining violently democratic opinions, appear to have no political opinions whatever, or if they think at all, rather lean towards the maintenance of things as they are, and part of whom, the coal whippers, are extremely proud of their having turned out to a man on the 10th of April, 1848, and become special constables for the maintenance of law and order on the day of the great Chartist demonstration. It has been shown that these same unskilled laborers constitute the most immoral class. The criminal returns prove them to be nine times as dishonest, five times as drunken, and nine times as savage, shown by the assaults, as the rest of the community. Of like import is the observation respecting convicts, quoted and confirmed by Captain Makanochi, that a good prisoner, that is, a submissive one, is usually a bad man. 
If again we turn over the newspapers which circulate amongst court satellites and chronicle the movements of the Hotan, which ascribe national calamities to the omission of a royal title from a new coin, and which apologize for continental despots, we read in them excuses for war and standing armies, sneerings at peacemongers, defenses of capital punishment, condemnations of popular enfranchisement, diatribes against freedom of exchange, rejoicings over territorial robberies and vindications of church rate seizures, showing that where belief in the sacredness of authority most lingers, belief in the sacredness of life, of liberty, and of property is least displayed. 7. The fact that during civilization hero worship and moral sense vary inversely is simply the obverse of the fact already hinted, that society is possible so long only as they continue to do this. Where there is insufficient reverence for the divine law, there must be supplementary reverence for human law. Otherwise, there will be complete lawlessness or barbarism. Evidently, if men are to live together, the absence of internal power to rule themselves rightly towards each other necessitates the presence of external power to enforce such behavior as may make association tolerable and this power can become operative only by being held in awe, so that wild races deficient in the allegiance-producing sentiment cannot enter into a civilized state at all, but have to be supplanted by others that can. And it must further follow that if in any community loyalty diminishes at a greater rate than equity increases, there will arise a tendency towards social dissolution, a tendency which the populace of Paris threatened to illustrate. How needful the continuance of a savage selfishness renders the continuance of a proportionate amount of power worship may be perceived daily. Listen to the chatterings of men about their affairs. Examine into trade practices, read over business correspondence, or get a solicitor to detail his conversations with clients. You will find that in most cases conduct depends not upon what is right, but upon what is legal. Provided they keep uh, the windy side of the law, the great majority are but little restrained by regard for strict rectitude. The question with your everyday man of the world is not, may the claimant justly require thus much of me, but rather, is it so nominated in the bond? If an action will lie, such an one will commonly enough take proceedings to obtain what he knows himself not equitably entitled to, and if the law allows it and the court awards it, will pocket all he can get without scruple. When we find doings like these regarded as matters of course and those guilty of them passing for respectable men, when we thus find that so many will deal fairly by their fellows only on compulsion, we discover how requisite is the sentiment from which the compelling instrumentality derives its power. Without doubt, this sentiment has begotten many gigantic evils, some of which it still nurtures. The various superstitions that have prevailed and that still prevail as to the great things legislatures can do, and the disastrous meddlings growing out of these superstitions are due to it. The veneration which produces submission to a government unavoidably invests that government with proportionately high attributes. For being in essence a worship of power, it can be strongly drawn out towards that only which either has great power or is believed to have it. Hence the old delusions that rulers can fix the value of money, the rate of wages, and the price of food. Hence the still current fallacies about mitigating distress, easing monetary pressures, and curing overpopulation by law. Hence also the monstrous though generally received doctrine that a legislature may equitably take people's property to such an extent and for such purposes as it thinks fit for maintaining state churches, feeding paupers, paying schoolmasters, founding colonies, etc. And hence, lastly, the astounding belief that an act of Parliament can abrogate one of nature's decrees, can, for instance, render it criminal in a traitor to buy goods in France and bring him here to sell, whilst the moral law says it is criminal to prevent him. As though conduct could be made right or wrong by the votes of some men sitting in a room in Westminster. 
Yet, in spite of all this, in spite of the false theories and mischievous interferences, the numberless oppressions, disasters, and miseries, in one way or other traceable to it, we must admit that this power worship has fulfilled and does still fulfill a very important function, and that it may advantageously last as long as it can. End of chapter 30, part 1